Welcome to our morning service here at Caronqua Chapel at Shiki Point, Texas. I'm Pastor James Rose, and I pray the service will be a blessing and a help to you. Let's keep each of people in prayer. Pray we stay healthy. Well, of course, I wanted to work on today. Is the love of Jesus something wonderful? I don't know if you heard it before. Is the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful, yes, wonderful. Oh, is the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. Now, what's the next step? You don't sing here. Okay. <laughs> central focus is the Bible, the Word of God. So I can encourage you to read and study and pray. Uh, one lady told me, said, well, I don't read the Bible. I get all I need on, on a Sunday morning. And I thought, that's all you get. It, it, that's a, it's like eating. How many days a week do you eat? <laughs> I want more than just one meal a week. <laughs> so I'm like that with the Word of God. <clears throat> We ought to have a desire for to know God's word. The way to keep from getting into error is the word of God. And Paul said to his followers, you follow me as I follow the Lord. Now, if I'm not following the Lord, don't follow me. It's as simple as that. A lot of religious leaders want people to follow them no matter what they say or do. Well, I'm not, I don't believe that. I, I, as long as I'm walking with the Lord, uh, I want to lead you. And uh, if I'm not walking right, don't follow me. Simple enough, huh? So, we ought to walk so that others will see. Sometimes we're surprised when somebody tells us something that uh, we've been a help or an encouragement, a, a blessing to them, and I've heard that about many people. That, oh, Jane or John or whatever has been such a blessing, they ministered to me when I was down. And so we ought to be realized, everybody has down times. Everybody has a hard time, I mean, Hey, don't make it harder on somebody else. Everybody has a downtime. But we want to study today in Ephesians, as we've been studying the last few Sundays. We talked about redemption last week. He paid for our sins. He took us out of the marketplace of slavery to sin. And uh, he said, we'll never again return to the marketplace of sin. And so he says we, we should be holy, even as the Father's holy. Now, are we holy? No. We're declared holy, but we're to seek to be holy in our lives. So Christianity is not what we do, it's what we be. <laughs> that doesn't make good grammar, I know. But uh, uh, we, we should be his children, and by faith in him we are. That one song he sang I disagreed with, it said, that, uh, I'm not waiting to see if I'm accepted in the end. I, I already know I belong to him. And uh, if I go now, and he talks about in, uh, in Ephesians here, we're talking about redemption. He redeemed us on the cross. We were personally redeemed when we accepted him as our personal Savior. And we will be redeemed when we're taken up to be with him. I can, I can relate with Tom. I was doing some uh, tape bedding uh, place this week, and uh, overhead, and uh, just eating my arms and hands, and screaming at me, and I got up this morning, I was hurting, I took that warm shower, and I said, oh, that feels so good. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
uh, the body, somebody said, the spirit may be willing, but the body said, who are you kidding? You can't do that anymore. <laughs> so we, we uh, have to realize one day we'll have a new body. Thank God for that. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. We may have tribulation. A lot of times there's a lot of preachers tell you all over thing. If you're walking with God, you'll never have trials. You'll never have tribulation. You'll never have sickness. That's a bunch of baloney. That's not the word of God. Uh, and, and if you think, and I, I went to a church as a visitor one night and I heard they were having a prayer request and they uh, brought up some man's name. I didn't know him. I was just a visitor there. And they brought him up and said, we, uh, quit, and one lady got up and said, quit praying for him. He doesn't have the faith to be healed, so quit praying, wasting your time praying for him. Because if, if he had faith to be healed, he'd be healed now. And, uh, folks, that has nothing to do with it. But that, <clears throat> that was the case. Job should have never gone through all the trials he did. But because he did, he's an example to us. Paul should have never, uh, even in the latter part of his ministry, said, uh, God, please heal me. He prayed and prayed and prayed. He said three times he begged God to heal him. God said, no, I'm not going to heal you. He said, uh, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And I say, thank God for that. Because more and more I realize our weakness personally. But now let's look at Ephesians 1, verse 9. And it says, he made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom we've also obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And here's a phrase he uses three times in this first chapter. What is our purpose in life? And this is it summed up in three different verses that says the same thing. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now then, our lives should honor God. Praise means to give honor to. And so we should be to the praise of his glory. Praise his grace, his glory, his mercy, his uh, tenderness, his forgiveness. All of these things we studied so far in this first chapter, and we'll cover some more again. So, uh, he talks about the mystery. Now, uh, we, we think, my, my wife loves mystery. She, 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 she got some mystery books over there, and she'll read those, and sometimes we read them and all that. She loves mystery. I love mystery. And, uh, you know, who done it? But the mystery in the Bible is not a who done it. God tells us, and we'll look at it in a moment. Uh, what a mystery is in chapter 3. But here he says the mystery of his will. God has a purpose in the whole history of the world. He's called the author and finisher of our faith. Somebody said, well, why does he allow all this? Why doesn't he stop all of this terrible things that's going on? He's written the book. And the, uh, the thing is, through the trials, he wants people to come to him not by coercion, but by faith. We come to him believing him and we should believe him in spite of the circumstances, not because of them. And no matter what happens, we look to him as the author and the other part of that verse, finisher of our faith. He doesn't want us just to begin well, he wants us to end well. And so our faith is that pause between uh, the time we accept him and the time we go to be with him. Dear old lady that I had at a funeral many years ago. Uh, she was 96 when she went on to be with the Lord. and uh, But she gave me something and she gave me some things she wanted me to share at her funeral. And she knew she'd be going. And she said, uh, Brother Rose, I want you to look at this. Here's somebody in the family that died. And it gave their birthdays like 1939 and, and 2015 or whatever it was. And she said, notice that little dash there? He said, that's her whole life, just a dash. But she said, I want my dash to be pleasing to God. And she was. She was a precious uh, saint that loved the Lord. So make sure our dash fulfills his will of praising his grace and goodness. Now then, uh, something, uh, a mystery in God's word is something 
that has not been revealed before but is now revealed. I've heard preachers talk about the church in the Old Testament. There was no church in the Old Testament. There was assemblies of Jews, but there was no church. The church began on Pentecost. It will leave this earth on, in the rapture, and we will be with him. And so uh, there was no church in the Old Testament. Church was something new. God didn't even really give any hints about the church in the Old Testament. Primarily, Old Testament truth applied to the Jews, but it also applies to history, and it's not over yet. So, the mystery of it, he said one of the things that the mystery of his will, number one for us, and it's in this chapter here, is the salvation of individuals. Now, God saves us, and he wants us to congregate. He talks about his church. His church is that Called, and the word church means called out one. I go into Palacios and I see this sign. Uh, what is it? Premier uh, Ecclesia Baptista. Does that make it right? Would you know? <laughs> it, it's, it's the first Baptist church for Spanish people. Uh, Premier is first uh, Ecclesia, and I'm not sure how they pronounce it. Iglesia? Iglesia. Iglesia. Iglesia, okay. I know I wouldn't pronounce it right, but anyway, <laughs> Iglesia, Premier Iglesia uh, Baptista. It's First Baptist Church is what it is. First Church Baptist. Uh, uh, so uh, the word there, Iglesia, it's actually closer than us using the word church because that is the actual word from the Greek of what the church was. It means called out ones. Out ones. We're called out of the world. We're called out. And not just out of something, but unto something. God doesn't just take us out of something. Well, no, that, that's it. You're, you're, yeah, you're not living like that anymore, so you're all right. <coughs> no, we're called to a purpose to fulfill praising the Lord. So we're called out of something, unto something. And sometimes I see people quit all kinds of habits and things like that. I know a girl and. and uh, uh, Arlington, Texas. No, she hasn't uh, been on drugs or drink for six years. I think she's praising uh, about that. She got out of that. But did she get into walking with God? The people quit all kinds of things and think, well, boy, I'm all right. I used to drink. I used to do all these things. But I don't do that anymore. But that's not enough. It's not that we just quit something. We need to be moving to something and with something, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says, he calls us, the will of God is our salvation. If you look at 2 Peter 3, 9, he says, he is not willing that any should perish. The word perish in the Bible simply means don't go to hell. He's not willing that anybody go to hell. I know a fellow that believes that uh, if you're in the elect, as he called it, then you're going to heaven. If you're not in the elect, you're going to hell. And, and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, you can come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He that cometh to me, I will in no way turn you away. I will not cast you out. I will not reject you. He that cometh to me, I will not reject. I will not turn you out. So, he said he's not willing that any should perish. Now, then, does that mean everybody's going to be saved? He that cometh to me, he that cometh to me. God gives an invitation. The end of the service. Uh, we don't necessarily have an invitation of people coming forward, but we have an invitation in that you need to realize God speaks to you if you're not saved, that you might come to him and have peace with God and forgiveness. Uh, somebody asked, they said, well, that person got saved when they came forward. I think they were saved when the moment God made them realize they needed to be saved. They, they'd probably sitting on a few, maybe in the home before they ever came to church that day. Man, I've got to get it right with God. I had a couple come to our church that I'd talked to before, and they, uh, they didn't want anything to do with God. So one Sunday morning, I get a telephone call and said, uh, what time church service starts? I told them what time it start. And I said, who is it? He said, you know who this is? I said, no, I don't. And they hung up on me. Uh, okay. <laughs> what was that about? So, 
what I did, of course, was watch the door, see who, <laughs> who I wasn't expecting to be there. And sure enough, this couple came in that I'd been talking to, and another family in our church worked with them, talked to them over a period of a year or two. And uh, I said, okay. <laughs> Nobody other, uh, stranger or anything came in except that morning. And so I talked to him afterwards and said, uh, you know where I've been the last two weeks? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I haven't seen you in some time. And he said, I've been in the hospital. I had a heart attack. And I uh, thought I was checking out. He said, scared the daylights out of me. He said, I realized, hey, I better get right with God or else. And so he did. And uh, his wife did. And so it was, it was wonderful. And they made wonderful, uh, precious friends and church members and everything after that. But sometimes God has to wake us up. Like the old boy talked about buying a mule that wouldn't do anything. The guy said, oh, that's no problem. you got to get his attention. How do you do that? Well, he said, just keep your two before handy and whack him up between, <laughs> between the eyes. Well, I don't recommend that. But he said, he, said, he did, and that old mule lifted his head up. It's like, okay, what do we do now? And so marching on. Sometimes God has to get our attention. And it may be through a sickness. It may be through somebody that has shown unusual care for us and things. No, that person has something that's different. I wish I had whatever they have. Maybe it's a peace they have. Maybe it's a joy they have. Whatever it is. And so uh, God makes known his will that he's not willing that we perish. And in uh, the book of John, uh, chapter 6 and verse 40, uh, he uses a, a phrase here. Just turn to it right quick. Uh, it says, This is the will of him that sent me, that was the Father sending the Son into the world, that everyone who sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up the last day. One day I'll leave this old world, I'll be raised up out of this, I don't care what happens to it, we'll be gone, we'll be in the presence of the Lord. So he gives it a very clear indication that he has a time and a place, he's going to bring us out. And, but it's when his will is that we believe on him. One reason I try to share the Bible in these verses is simply because it's not important what I think or what uh, any denomination or organization thinks. It's what does God say. And if I share with you, and I've had people say over and over, well, God spoke to me through some verse you shared. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit. I don't pick on anyone. Uh, God, God takes care of that. And so it says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So if I give you God's word and you trust him, God lets you know that that is his truth. So if the mystery of his will is that we come to know him as personal Savior. The next mystery that we look at in Ephesians 1 is the mystery, we call it, of his body. And his body is a group of believers. Just as our body is made up of cells and molecules and parts and, and systems and <coughs> the, the, the blood circulatory system. Yes, thank you, Jerry. Uh, my sinus gives me fits and today it's working overtime. <laughs> uh, he, he, and the skeletal system. God's body is made up of individuals. Thank you. It's different. Every one of us is different. Doesn't, God doesn't want us to be carbon copies of each other. He wants us to take who he made us as to serve him. Excuse me. You see old preachers do that. And I, I didn't have thought a young fellow like me would do that. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you know better. So... The mystery of his body. There in Ephesians chapter 1, he talks about that he's going to bring a body together. Now, the passage I read to you, Paul said in verse 11 that through God's grace and the fact that he revealed his salvation, that we also have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So his will is that we understand his purpose in our lives. But then down to verse 13, he says, 
in whom ye also trusted. Now, what's he talking about? We who are Jews were the first to trust him, God says in his word, to the Jew first, and then to the non-Jew, the Gentiles, or the Greeks. So he says, we who were Jews first trusted him, but now we're sharing it with you who are not Jews. And so he said that you too uh, can enjoy this salvation after you heard the word of truth. And now you're sealed with that Spirit of God into the family of God. Well, I love that song. I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. So in chapter 3, he, he gives that. If we start in there again, he talks about the mystery. In fact, the word mystery is found six times in the book of Ephesians. And he talks about, he made known to me that mystery. And now I want you to understand that knowledge, my knowledge of that mystery in Christ. And verse 5 tells you what a mystery is, which in the other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. I had a friend that was uh, Jewish and... Uh, uh, he was in church and all that. And then he got with a group of people that said, no, Jews should not go to church with Gentiles. They need to have their own order and their own way, and we need to reestablish. And, and really what he's trying to do is put him back under the old laws. No, God says we're one body. Jews ought to be able to go to church with Gentiles. And people, all this stuff about race, there, there's no race in the Bible. You show me in the Bible where there's such things as racist. People say he's racist. People say, oh, the black race, the white race, the, the, the African American race. Uh, I filled out a form not too long ago. It had like six or seven different. I said, good grief, what in the world is this? Well, that's the different races. There is only one race. We, everyone, came, of course, from Adam, but we all came from Noah and from one of his three sons. Now, there's no races. God has ethnic groups. He has national groups. In fact, God said, I set apart the bounds of their habitation that they might seek after God. Now, when men have rebelled against God's teaching, of course, that's why we got the mess we have today. Well, people rebel against his teaching. So here, he said he has this mystery, and that's something that in the Old Testament was never mentioned. The church was never mentioned. It is in the New Testament, in the writings of Paul. And so he, he said it was not made known uh, to people, to the, the sons of men, but it's now revealed, at, uh, and that's simply that we should have a fellowship together with believers. Now our fellowship here is not based on denomination. It's not based on organization. It's not based on some man's theory. It's on our relationship to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so that's what he says. We have a fellowship together because we're part of that family. And then the third mystery, and we're going to jump out of Ephesians for just a moment to Colossians and uh, chapter 1 and uh, verse 27, where he says, God would make known what the richest of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I said, there's nothing in the Bible about us receiving Jesus Christ and asking him to come into our lives. Well, they missed a few verses if they say that. Because here he says, Christ is in us. We invite him in. It says in Revelation, the great verse I remember from my salvation is Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I will come in and will sup with him, fellowship with him. So the idea of supper, uh, when, when you invite somebody to supper, it's, it's, it's a time should be a fellowship. And, and we'll have the Lord's Supper in a few minutes. If you're a child of God, you're invited to partake of that because it's a fellowship of what God's done for you. And as we look at it in just a moment, uh, we call it. Uh, the Lord's Supper. What's another name for the Lord's Supper you hear? Communion. communion. Yeah, communion. What is communion? 
Commune, when I commune with you, what am I doing? I'm talking, interacting with you, right? And that's what communion is. We're interacting with God himself, thanking him for the price he paid for our salvation, but our fellowship. God didn't just save us to go to heaven when we die. He wants fellowship with us. That's why we emphasize uh, the local church. It's a place of fellowship among God's people. So he said here, the mystery is Christ dwells in us. How does he do that? Each individual has Christ in them. Well, yes, he has the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit of Christ. And he, it's the positive assurance of his presence. And it's the positive assurance that when we die, we'll see him in heaven. I don't hope I'll make it to heaven. I know I am. Say, what if you get out of line? I'm guaranteeing you, God will let me know and he'll discipline me. But I'll still be his child. Nowhere in the Bible do you ever see anybody being unborn, physically or spiritually. I don't like my parents. I'm going to go back and get born somewhere else, some other way. I don't like my parents. I want to be born again with somebody else. Huh? <laughs> I don't know anybody. could be unborn. Huh? Same way with God. You're his child. I guarantee you, he will speak to you as a child. He will discipline you. And then in the last chapter, we'll look at just a moment of uh, God's work in marriage. Now, what does marriage have to do with the mystery? Yeah, well, marriage is pretty much a mystery. <laughs> most of us, most of our lives. Uh, I didn't hear any amens. Amen. Or old me. So. <laughs> but he talks about marriage being a mystery of what? Verse 32 of chapter 5 of Ephesians said, This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible-believing church is that of a marriage. Now then, let's back it up. What's the thing with a marriage? A marriage should be a union of two believers. Now, sometimes people got saved when they weren't Christians and later got saved. Sometimes one got saved and the other didn't. And there was always some discord or disagreement there because one of them was a child of God, one is not. So you've got to understand what he's saying in relationship of man and woman is two Christians, two believers, two children of God. And he said, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. <clears throat> now, it's not a one-way street. In Constantine, South Carolina, many years ago, the guy ran, uh, he ran a honky-tonk, and uh, he had uh, a striptease act. And so uh, he had some woman did striptease there. But then he says to his wife, you know, I'm not going to pay a woman to do that. You've got a beautiful body. You're going to get out there and strip tees. And she came to our church, and her daughter, two teenage daughters, came to our church. And she told me, Preacher, I, I, I've got a, my husband said I can't come to church anymore. And uh, he said, The Bible says I'm to do his will in everything. I said, He doesn't have anything in the Bible to tell you to do his will in that which violates the clear teaching in the Word of God. And I said, You know, that's wrong. Yes, I do, but I've got to obey him. And so she went a few weeks, and then uh, her daughters decided, well, we're going to strip these. Oh, boy, that didn't sit well. <laughs> and Mama stole it finally and said, whoa, stop right now. This has got to stop. I'm no longer going to strip, and my daughters are definitely not going to strip. They, they supposedly your daughters, but you're, you're treating them like some, uh, some display out. So they, they came back to church. And uh, you've got to have two Christians there. Many times in marriage, and, and sad to say, a lot of men will profess to be Christian, and women will profess to be Christian in a relationship with someone, and they're not. And it, it ports over with it and calls discord. But submitting yourself one to another. Wives, submit yourself to your own husband, not to some others, as unto the Lord. And uh, uh, I say, well, my wife's to obey me. Wait a minute now. What's that? Where's that word? Well, we made that vows in, in our marriage vows. 
says, obey. Hmm? You ever heard about the man who obey the wife? Well, I'm treading on the dangerous ground. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> but the thing is very simply, he says to the husband, you love your wife as Christ loved the church. Now, I don't think a woman has a problem following a man that's walking with God if she knows that he genuinely loves her. I don't think a man will have any problem with a woman who loves him and want to do those things that are for her benefit, for her protection, her provision. I mean, when I grew up, man worked to provide for his wife. Uh, a couple I had in our church, uh, their, their uh, son wanted to get married to this girl, and he said, all right. Here's the deal. You've got to get a job. And you've got to provide for her. And her daddy was the same thing. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll not give my daughter to you, a hand in marriage to you, your son anyway, uh, until he can provide for her. Well, that ought to be. He ought to care for her. He ought to provide for her. He ought to watch out for her uh, health welfare. And so the whole thing is about wives. As you're submissive to your husband, he must love you as Christ loved. So, fellas, do you love your wife? Do you love her like Christ loved his bride, the church? He gave himself for her. He died on the cross for her. Are you willing to sacrifice for that woman? I think if she knows she has a man that's willing to sacrifice for her, she'll sacrifice for him. And that's the whole thing. He says, now men love your wives as their own bodies. I was teasing with my wife this morning. I said, uh, I love me, I love me, I'm so glad I love me, I'm so glad I love me because I love you. She said, what is that? <laughs> she looks at me. <laughs> We're sitting in the chair eating breakfast or whatever, and she looks at me and says, what is that? I said, well, I love me by loving you. And so I, I shared this scripture with him. Huh? He said, a man loves his wife as his own body. So if I love me, I'm going to love my wife. I saw a bumper sticker. that says, men, do yourself a favor. Love your wife. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that's what it is. If you love yourself, which you do, then you love your wife, which is a blessing both to her and you. It's not one-sided. It's not one way. It's not unbalanced. No man ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord does the church. So that's how our marriage ought to depict our relationship with God. Any questions? Now, <laughs> boy, it's all quite scared me. It's quite, amen. But that's one of the mysteries is the mystery of marriage as it depicts the relationship of the believer to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to have the Lord's Supper here in, in just a moment. Now, if you're saved, you're welcome to take the Lord's Supper. We do not practice closed communion here simply because it's the Lord's Supper, not the church's supper, not man's supper, the Lord's Supper. Amen? Amen. All right. I can get our elders to come forward and uh, take care of passing that out. We have communion every fifth Sunday. We can try to
It says, take this bread as representative of my body, which is given for you. And as often as you do this, it's a testimony that I trust in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of his body. We saw the message on redemption last week for our sin. says this cup is the new covenant or new testament in my blood which is shed for you